I'm Deborah Atkinson. You're listening to Flipping 50, where I address your top struggles and concerns, and I share what to eat, how to move, and how to change your mindset so you can have the energy and the vitality that you want, need, and deserve in the second and better path. If you've heard me talk, even for a minute, you've been in our community, you've heard me talk about fatigue, reaching muscular fatigue at the end of each and every repetition that you do, and ideally at the end of every set. Now, maybe not every repetition, depending on what science you're following, because some of the new science for women over 40 actually does focus on every single repetition. However, We're not talking about that kind of fatigue today, which makes what I do and talk about a little bit tricky. But what I want to focus on here is the kind of fatigue that is just bone gripping, that's life stifling, that stops you from doing the kind of things that you want to do every day, That maybe has you start in the morning thinking, oh, today I'd like to do this and this and this. And by the end of the day, you're thinking, cross that off, cross that off. I'm actually going to recline in front of the sofa or on the sofa in front of the TV. And if you are stuck and stopped by those kinds of feelings, we know that, of course, there's menopause, there's hormonal changes, there's something that we can do for you. But my guest today is really the expert on cracking the code on chronic fatigue. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about the causes, the contributing factors, and we'll talk about what you can do. He's not a stranger to my podcast because this topic is something near and dear to our hearts, not because of muscular fatigue, but because of just bodily fatigue the kind that is like a curtain draped over you when you're trying to pull the curtains and let the sunshine come in. So I want you to dive in. I want you to either go for your walk, be ready to do a workout, or put this on while you're preparing dinner or commuting, whatever fits for you. But listen, and listen carefully. The biggest message that we both want you to get is there's something you can do. There are actions you can take even though you may feel like you've tried everything. Let's dig in and I will let the expert take over. My guest and friend today is Evan Hirsch. He is a world-renowned fatigue expert and the founder and CEO of the International Center for Fatigue. Through his best-selling book, podcast, and international online programs, he's helped thousands of people around the world optimize their energy naturally and is on a mission to help one million more. He's been featured on television podcast summits, and when he's not at the office, you can find him singing musicals, dancing, and playing basketball with his family. (laughs) Evan, thanks so much for being here. Deborah, thanks so much for having me on. And what is it that you sing? Um, you mean which musicals? Yeah. Well, right now I'm actually singing a song called Into the Fire, uh, which is from the musical Scarlet Pimpernel, which is by the same guy who also did the Jekyll and Hyde musical. So it's not very well known, but it's a good song for those who want to Google it. Okay. (laughs) I love it. And this is why you told me in the green room, your 13 year old has run away. (laughs) (laughs) It definitely could be, you know, like I'm not allowed to sing unless my my office door is closed. That's definitely a rule, yeah. (laughs) That's the rule. Oh, okay. So you are talking to a captive audience. Well, not so captive. So keep listening, everybody. (laughs) But many of them will echo this sentiment over and over, like, I'm tired. I'm always tired. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about being tired, and of course, I talk about muscle fatigue, we're not going there today. How does somebody know if they actually have fatigue as more of a syndrome or issue? Yeah, it really is not as complex as we would think. You know, if if we are more tired than we think we should be, that is enough for us to start looking. Now, we're not talking about, you know, being diagnosed with something, but what we are talking about is getting the most out of life. 
And when it comes down to it, the more energy that you have, the more you can really get out of life, whether it's work, personal, relationships, whatever it is that you want to be doing. So usually I say it's tiredness not relieved by rest. And so this means if you're getting seven to nine hours of sleep a night and you're still tired during the day, then you have, quote unquote, fatigue on the spectrum. And yes, you need to do something about it before it gets worse. But recently, I've been kind of changing that up a little bit because so many people who have fatigue also have sleep issues. So you could, you, you may think you're getting seven to nine hours of sleep a night, but maybe you've got sleep apnea, or maybe you're just not getting enough deep sleep, or maybe you're having a hard time falling asleep or having a hard time staying asleep, and you're not getting seven to nine hours, no matter how hard you try, and you're tired, you still obviously need to get help. And interestingly enough, the causes of fatigue are also the causes of sleep issues. So when you fix one, you fix the other. And then the, the larger picture is, is that all of these things that we're going to be talking about today that end up causing fatigue are also the same things that end up causing diseases of longevity. So this includes things like heart attack, heart disease, stroke, and Alzheimer's. So when you start to get this sign of your body essentially knocking on the door or eventually starting to scream at you that there is a problem, you need to stand up and pay attention because yes, you can power through with caffeine and energy drinks and whatever, but your body is giving you a larger picture of what is going on, that there is a problem and you don't want to get any of these diseases of longevity. Yeah, great point. And I, gosh, I love that point. So I, I don't want to botch it. So I want you to repeat this again. So what fixes sleep will also fix fatigue or what exactly. causes sleep problems also causes fatigue problems? Exactly. What's Yeah. So what's interesting is that oftentimes people are thinking, well, you know, I'm tired mm -hmm. because I'm not sleeping well. And yes, that's part of it. But oftentimes the reasons why people have sleep issues and have fatigue issues are the same. So it's these deficiencies that we're going to talk about, as well as the toxicities. Love it. Love it. Okay. You talk a little bit about levels and so I want to dive into that. So what is level one problem versus what are the three levels of fatigue? Yeah, great question. So if you can fix your fatigue by changing your lifestyle habits, so this means sleeping more. Let's say you're burning the candle, you're getting only five to six hours a night, and you decide that you're going to increase your the number of hours of sleep, so then you're going to increase it up to somewhere between seven to nine hours. Let's say you're going to drink half your body weight in ounces when it comes to water. Let's say you're going to start moving more, start working with Deborah and getting your body moving and all that. Let's say that you are um, also going to be eating better. So those are all lifestyle habits that if you change those and your fatigue goes away, then that was a level one problem. If you do those things and you're still not better, then you have a level two or a level three problem. A level two problem is if you take some supplements to replace deficiencies. So these are deficiencies in things like hormones, vitamins, minerals, neurotransmitters, mitochondrial function. So you take supplements, replace those deficiencies, and you get better. That means you had a level two problem. If you have a level three problem, it means that you've, you've done the, the first two parts and you're still tired. And this means that you have the toxicities that are present. These can be heavy metals, chemicals, molds infections, allergies, negative emotional problems, electromagnetic fields, all of these things that are in the body that aren't supposed to be. So these are the toxicities. So that that's those are the three levels, how you can determine. Um, and you're not really going to know initially, you're just going to know as you progress through this process. Very helpful. So I want to unpack that a little bit for... So most of our listeners are in some stage of menopause, perimenopause or postmenopause. For many of them, it could fatigue could be very related to hormone imbalances. So mm -hmm. would you would you take a, an educated guess that many of them potentially are at a level two problem? I definitely would. I definitely would. Now, what's interesting also about that, though, is you don't want to immediately jump to progesterone and estrogen 
even though progesterone helps women fall asleep and estrogen helps them stay asleep. And then they may be familiar with some of the other symptoms associated with the deficiencies of these hormones. But what's interesting is that you can actually, if you if you have a smooth transition into menopause, it means that your adrenal glands and your thyroid are working well and they're compensating for the ovaries getting more quiescent or getting quiet. And so we always want to look and see how things are going first with the adrenals and the thyroid first before we ever jump into giving anybody any sex hormones, including when they're menopausal. So that's just an aside, but something for people to think about. I love that. And I also want to come back to, so as you described problems, were you not also basically giving us that this is the level of intervention and the Mm -hmm. order of it? Yes and no. So most of the time when I see people, they've already done the lifestyle habit thing. Um, but what ends up happening sometimes is is that if people are burnt out on that life on the lifestyle habit stuff, then they go away from it because they don't see any success, and they may be tired to a point of not actually having the energy to change the lifestyle. So when we actually go through the process, I have people replace deficiencies in hormones and vitamins and mitochondria first before we get into lifestyle habits because oftentimes they're just too tired to make those lifestyle habits. So when we give them that boost of things that have to happen anyway, for the most part, then they have the energy to actually change those lifestyle habits. So we try to work with people in this way because sometimes, you know, like oftentimes they're thinking, oh, I'm just going to have to change my, my diet and all this sort of stuff. And I'm too tired to do so. And it's like, actually, no, there are, there are, we do kind of flip things around a little bit. Super helpful. And I love that if you're listening and you've been feeling, I think a lot of women can beat themselves up. Like, Mm -hmm. I just can't get motivated. I'm lazy. And this may be a part of it. You need a little help first in order to be able to do the things that thoughtfully you'd like to do. Love it. Yeah, it's such an important point and, and uh, something that a lot of practitioners don't pay more attention to. Uh, you got to you meet the person where they're at and you have to support them in that moment and then figure out how to get the other stuff done. All right. I'm going to ask you a loaded question. I feel a little silly for asking. Go for it. <laughs> um, because I feel like I should know the answer. Or Actually, I have my own little list over here. But what are the actual causes of fatigue? Oh, that's not a silly question at all. I mean, it's a this is this is the question because if if somebody is tired, they just have to figure out which causes they have. I mean, this is the this is the whole point of this talk essentially is that if somebody is tired, they just have to figure out their causes. Whether you have a, a human resources problem at work or whether you have a problem with your car, you have to figure out what the problem is, what the causes are, because if you don't, you're never going to have success. So in order to know those causes, you have to, in order to figure out your causes, you have, to, you have to have a broad differential. You have to know all of the causes that are present. So these causes can really be grouped into deficiencies and toxicities, These deficiencies are deficiencies in hormones like adrenals, thyroid, sex hormones, deficiencies in vitamins and minerals like vitamin D, vitamin B12, um, minerals like magnesium or iron, deficiencies in neurotransmitters like serotonin, GABA, dopamine, deficiencies in mitochondrial function, which produces about 70 to 80 percent of our ATP, our main energy producing molecule. And then deficiencies in lifestyle habits. So not enough water, not enough good food, not enough movement, not enough sleep. So those are the deficiencies. And then in the toxicities, we're looking at things like heavy metals. 100,000 pounds of mercury are dumped into our oceans every single year. 70% of all lipsticks have lead in them. Those are just some of the stats. When we look at chemicals, 84,000 different chemicals we're exposed to on a regular basis, and most of those haven't been appropriately assessed by the FDA and other scientific bodies for health. 
And so that's a huge problem. When we're looking at mold, about half of all the buildings in first world countries have water damage, and most of those have mold. Mold is incredibly insidious and can cause anything from rashes to itchy ear, itchy anus, um, sinus issues, a whole bunch of things. And we call these the usual suspects, the heavy metals, chemicals, molds, and infections. And then with infections, the CDC a number of years ago, really quite recently, had used to say that there were 30,000 new cases of Lyme per year. I think that was probably five years ago. And now the number is 476,000 this year. We'll have what? more cases of Lyme. Yep. And that doesn't include other type of Lyme infections, including Babesia, Bartonella, Epstein-Barr virus. Ehrlichia, anaplasma, a number of other things. And then there's um, electromagnetic fields. Anything that emits rays, anything that has a battery in it can damage our DNA and cause inflammation in the body. And then there's negative emotional patterns or things that have also been classified as ACEs or adverse childhood events or what I call adverse life events, where at any point in your life, if you've had some sort of negative, negative event or an event that you perceive to be negative, that will change your relationship to the world. Perhaps the world no longer is a safe place for you. And so that's going to increase stress on the body and increase inflammation as well. So it's really a combination of all of these things that somebody's going to have. Now, not, don't get overwhelmed by this number, but these can be broken out into 33 different causes of fatigue. And everybody who has um, significant fatigue has 20 plus causes. And oftentimes it's, a, it's an accumulation of these causes. And so you may feel fine until a particular moment, maybe it was menopause, maybe it was something else where like, as soon as I lived in that house, you know, I felt like crap. And so maybe that was mold, but maybe that was also an accumulation of stuff throughout your life. You know, I grew up and ate gluten and dairy, didn't uh, uh, bowel movement appropriately for the first 20 years of my life. I had a bowel movement once a week for the first 20 years of my life. Didn't realize I was supposed to have two a day until around that time. I had mercury fillings, all those silver things in your mouths. That's mercury. I had I grew up on tuna fish, so I had a whole bunch of mercury. I had lots of plastics I used to drink out of hot uh, plastic water bottles when I was driving across country. And so I got a lot of plastics in my body, lived in moldy homes, you know. And so all of a sudden you think, okay, it was from this moment. But in actuality, it's kind of this accumulation over time. And then there's something that's the straw that broke the camel's back. But the good news is that there's nothing that we ever talk about that we can't fix. So you just have to find which causes you have and work through this process of removing each one of these causes. It's kind of like puzzle pieces. You just put in all the puzzle pieces and then you're good to go. Okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so glad I asked. <laughs> all, right, all right. And a little overwhelmed. So yes. <laughs> I would imagine then that I might answer my own question or you just did. I, as in, why is it so hard to treat fatigue? Is that because of all the sources? That's one of them, is that, yes, there are a lot of causes, but what really makes it hard is that everybody has different causes of fatigue. So the causes that Joe Schmo has might be causes 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and Sally Sue might have 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. And so then that means if Sally gets a B12 shot and she feels better because she had a B12 deficiency and Joe says, well, I want to get a B12 shot because Sally's my friend and it helped her and he gets a B12 shot and doesn't feel the difference. It's because the focus wasn't on the causes, right? Coming back, coming back to it's all about the causes. So he wasn't paying enough attention to what his causes were. And he was just thinking, okay, I'm going to take this supplement. I'm going to take this treatment. I'm going to take this IV. I'm going to take hyperbaric oxygen. I'm going to take IV ozone, whatever it is to fix my problem instead of actually focusing on what the problem is and then matching it up with the correct treatment. So that's really the, that's, the, the, there's, a, there's a lot of causes and not enough practitioners are looking at all those causes. Oftentimes they're looking at the deficiencies. That's very common with naturopaths and integrative docs and functional medicine docs, which is awesome. And sometimes they'll dip their toe into some of the toxicities. Maybe they'll deal with heavy metals. Maybe they'll deal with 
molds, maybe they'll deal with infections, but it's rare when they're dealing with all of those things. So you just have to make sure when you go to talk to somebody who's going to be a new practitioner for you, do you address all these things? And then how do you address all these things? And how many people have you helped with all of these things so that you can get that clarity? So you got to find that good practitioner. So that's what makes it challenging. You've got to figure out what your causes are because everybody's causes are different. Um, And so those are kind of, those are the main reasons why it's so hard to treat. Those were some golden questions to ask a practitioner as you're interviewing listeners. So I hope you got those. We'll have those in the show notes, by the way. And Evan, so you, of course, are the expert doctor in this area. So I know you have a four-step fix your fatigue system. Can you talk a little bit about what you use to treat those causes? Absolutely. So the first step, if you haven't guessed it, is finding the causes. So we take you through a process, and fortunately, 75% of those 33 causes can be determined by symptoms alone. So when people sign up for our program, usually within the first hour or two, once they've gone, started to go through the step one in the workbook, they can find 75% of their causes just by their symptoms. They don't need labs or anything else, just their symptoms. And so that's really important is figuring out what those causes are. And then you can do the labs later and, and flush things out for the other 25%. So that's step one, assess the causes. And then step two is replacing the deficiencies. So I should take a step back and say, this process is all about the toxicities. The heavy metals, the chemicals, the molds, the infections, the allergies, the negative emotional patterns, the electromagnetic fields. And I just keep saying those because I want to pound those into people's brains because they're so important that those get assessed. So this process is all about step four, which is removing those things. However, you can't go directly at them because you won't be successful because pulling crap out of the body, pulling those toxicities out of the body, crap is a medical term, by the way, (laughs) (laughs) pulling it out of the body is very challenging to do if you haven't done step two and step three. And so step two is replacing the deficiencies. So this is the adrenals and the thyroid and the mitochondria, what I call the big three, that gives you the biggest initial shift in your energy so that you can then do the rest of it. And that as things come up, you have resilience. Any sort of stressor of removing these toxicities in step four will be dealt with because you are, you are stronger and more robust because of what you're taking in step two. So replacing deficiencies is step two. And then step three is opening up the detoxification pathways. So this is liver, kidney, intestines, lymph, neurolymph, which is the lymph system in the brain. And so these are, I see them as tubes in the body that are all clogged with this crap, these toxicities, and that these these pathways need to be open in order to go into step four, grab the first toxicity, pull it into the bloodstream, and let it get out of the body. Because if, if those pathways, if those tubes are not open, then when you grab that toxicity, it's just going to go right back into the body into a different compartment. So that's why step three is so important, getting those things open so that you can actually be successful in step four. And then step four is removing the toxicities over time. Wow, very comprehensive. So can you can you tell me this? And maybe this is just too open-ended, but someone does come in and they begin your programming. What is the timeline? We always want it yesterday's yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> So it's a great question. It depends on the number of causes that they have and the severity of the causes. So generally, it's going to take somebody 6 to 12 months. Our program is a six-month program. And so if people want to continue with us, they're able to do so in our, in our graduate monthly membership. But it's, there are a number of different causes that can take six months or 12 months on their own. 
And so we layer these in there. We like to go slow and steady because the body really likes small changes. And so for heavy metals, chemicals, molds, and infections, each one of those could take six months in order to get completely out of your system. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to take that long for your energy to be resolved or for your energy to be improved, rather. So our goal is always for every month or two, you're going to increase by one one point or one level. So if your energy is a four out of 10, where 10 is ideal energy, after a month or two, you're going to be a five out of 10. Another month or two, you're going to be a six out of 10. So you're still improving over this time, but it may take six to 12 months for all of these toxicities to be out of your body. Because remember, all these toxicities are also the causes of heavy or of heart attacks, heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, cancer, autoimmune diseases. So we want to get those out of our body anyway. So it's kind of like you, you're getting a master's degree in your health and you're setting yourself up for success by removing these toxicities so you don't have to deal with them later in life. When would you rather deal with them? When you're 50 or when you're... 60, 70, 80, right? Where it's a lot harder to, you know, you, let's say you don't have your brain function, right? You're, you're trying to deal with some of these things that are just going to be more complex for you as you get older. So the more work that you do now, and you know this as well, and this is what you teach too, more work that you can do now, more you can invest in your health, the better off you're going to be long-term. So true. So true. Okay. Can we, can we unpack a little bit more about some of the chronic infections sure. and and the symptoms associated with each? Absolutely. So this is, this is a lot of fun for me. I really enjoy this because <laughs> <laughs> you're sick. I know. So sick. <laughs> well, these infections, it just, it, they're so interesting to me how they can create these conglomeration of symptoms depending on where they are in the body. So let's take Borrelia first, which was originally found in the 80s in Lyme, Connecticut. It's the main. Um, infection that is named for Lyme. And when we say Lyme and its co-infections, we're talking about a number of things right now, but Borrelia burgdorferi is, you know, quote unquote, Lyme disease. Not Lyme's disease. It's not belonging to Lyme. It is Lyme disease, just for those who are taking notes. (laughs) Um, And so what's important about Borrelia, you can't So the first thing is about testing. So the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta have said that the testing that we have available is not good and that the Western blot test and the ELISA test, which is typically what practitioners are using, are actually for epidemiologic studies only. They're for research. They're not for diagnosis. What is for diagnosis is your symptoms. These are clinical diagnoses. So Borrelia, you can't really have Borrelia unless you have these two symptoms. So symptoms that move around the body. So this can be muscle pain, nerve pain, or joint pain. That's, let's say, in the left shoulder today. And then next week or next month, it's in the right knee, right? So they're moving around the body. It could be like shooting pains in your hand and then goes to shooting pains in the foot a couple days, a couple weeks, a couple months later, okay? And you also have to have symptoms that come and go where usually people describe that they're not able to make plans with friends because they're not sure whether or not it's going to be a good day. Now, it doesn't mean that you have that the other days are good. Usually days are bad, but then there's an, um, there are especially bad days where you really can't get out of bed or you can't go and be with people. So if you don't have those symptoms, you can't really have Borrelia. So that's the first thing. The other thing is let's look at Bartonella. So Bartonella acutely will will cause cat scratch fever. A cat scratches you, you get big lymph nodes and a fever. But with all of these these infections, we're talking about them as more in their chronic form. Bartonella will come from about 50%, upwards of 50% of all domestic animals have Bartonella in them. And so if they're licking you or drooling on you or whatever, whether a dog or a cat, it's very likely that you have Bartonella, but you don't necessarily have the symptoms of Bartonella until you get some of these other toxicities. So heavy metals, chemicals, molds, and then all of a sudden you start to get Bartonella symptoms. Now Bartonella loves, it's got two phases. It loves being in the muscles and then it loves being in the skin. And so when it's in the muscles, you're going to get muscle cramps, usually in the calves, usually at night. It may be relieved by drinking more water, taking magnesium, taking potassium, eating a banana. But in reality, 
it's really, if it's not associated with exercise, then it's most likely from Bartonella. Oftentimes, people will also have pain in the feet, usually misdiagnosed as plantar fasciitis. So this might be a discomfort in the feet, a burning in the feet. Um, it can, people can also have muscle pain um, incorrectly diagnosed as fibromyalgia. So this may be in the back or the shoulders. People will also have, may have migraines. They may have problems sleeping, falling asleep or staying asleep. They may have anxiety or, or depression. And a major cause of low thyroid or Hashimoto's thyroiditis or autoimmune thyroid is also Bartonella. Quick funny story is that I have found that by treating Bartonella for people who are on thyroid, that they end up having to wean off of their thyroid medication. It's usually about 50% of the time they're able to wean down off of it a certain amount. And there's a funny serendipity story that goes along with that. But suffice it to say, if you're on thyroid and you have Bartonella and you start treating Bartonella appropriately, you're going to need to wean down off of your thyroid to a certain amount. You're going to find that you are hyperthyroid when previously you were hypo or you were low thyroid. So, yeah, so that's been really interesting to see. But those are a lot of the symptoms that people will experience with um, with Bartonella. And then in the skin phase, oftentimes they'll experience skin rashes Oftentimes, they'll look like stretch marks and they'll be like, you know, I haven't had any weight fluctuations. I'm not sure why I have these stretch marks or they might be in weird places on the body. And sometimes they look like three finger scratch that's just stayed there. And so you don't have to have all those symptoms. But if you have, you know, muscle cramps, hard time sleeping, some anxiety, it's very possible that you have Bartonella and you're going to want to get that assessed and get that treated. So maybe the last infection I'll talk about is Babesia which is considered the North American malaria. And these people are usually the hottest person in the room. Oh, I should mention that Bartonella, usually those people are the coldest people in the room. And even after you optimize their thyroid, they're still cold. But with Babesia, they're kind of the hottest person in the room. So oftentimes they're outside shoveling snow in a t-shirt or they're saying, hey, can you please turn up the AC? It's really hot in here and everybody else is cold or normal temperature, right? So they may also have spontaneous sweating. And this is different than hot flashes. Oftentimes, if people are having both, they know, they can tell the difference. It doesn't kind of creep up on you and cause this sort of flushing. It's usually like a spontaneous sweat. Sometimes it's at night. Sometimes it's during the day. People will also have shortness of breath, hard time catching their breath. They may describe it as air hunger. And then, unfortunately, they usually will have really bad sleep. So this is one of those that has like a crossover with sleep and fatigue where the causes are are the same, where you can have really awful sleep if you have Babesia, anxiety to the point of panic attacks, and depression to the point of suicidal thoughts. So unfortunately, oftentimes when people have really bad mood issues, it's most of the time, Babesia, maybe a little bit of Bartonella, but oftentimes it's Babesia. And, and those and the people who are committing suicide from having these infections oftentimes have Babesia as well. And like I said, you don't have to have all of those symptoms, but if you have a couple of them, like let's say your sleep is awful, you've got really bad anxiety, um, that could definitely be Babesia. Wow. Okay. You know way too much about things that are not fun. Okay. So uh, question that, I mean, you're the go-to. If I had a problem, I'd be coming to you. There must be people that you feel you can or cannot help. How do you know you can help someone or not? That's a great question. So a lot of it really depends on their ability to follow through with the program. So people generally, they need to be organized so that they can take supplements because that's a big tool that we have. Everything that we do is natural. I operate as a health coach in the online environment so that I can work across state and national lines. And so everything is herbs and supplements and all sorts of stuff like that. So they have to be organized and be able to take those things. They have to be um, able to move out of a moldy environment or remediate a moldy environment. That's one of the biggest challenges that people have. They have to be able to um, be committed 
they have to be able to be optimistic because this is process is very much a three steps forward, one step back sort of process where there are bumps in the road when you're killing off infections or removing toxicities. You may feel worse. We may have to increase some of the um, the detox support or the die-off support or the Herxheimer support, whatever you want to call it, from step three. So oftentimes there there are those pivots and they have to be able to ask questions when things come up. And that's really the biggest thing is because everything is kind of built in for them in the program to get the help that they need, but they have to ask for it. And if they're not sure, but they're not getting, they're not getting where they want to go, then they have to just put that out there as well so that we can end up helping them. But those are generally the biggest things that we see for, um, for how long it takes. And then it's the drive. Um, you, you have to just every single day, you have to remember that this is a journey, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step and that baby steps, you will win the race. You know, we overestimate the amount that we can get done in a day and we underestimate the amount that we can get done in a year. So people who are committed every single day, they wake up and they think to themselves, what can I do today to move my health forward? What's one thing that I can do? And that's all you have to do is every single day, take another step forward, check something else off on the workbook, and you will reach that finish line. So you just, you have to be committed. You need to be organized. You need to be optimistic and you have to um, be motivated to get it done. Amen. (laughs) So true of so many things. That was a great answer. All right. So while I've got you here, Evan, I, it's been a wealth of information. I can't thank you enough for really pouring out so much content here that is so valuable for our listeners. But is there a question that I didn't ask you that you'd like to answer? Well, I think the most important thing is for people to not get overwhelmed. You just have to take the first step. You just have to take action no matter what it is. You need to fit, you need to find all of your causes, whether you're working with me or working with somebody else. That's the first thing you want to make sure you're working with a practitioner who's going to address all these causes. And then you just have to move through it and just and and never stop until you get to your goal and maintain that we work a lot with mindset in our program where we're looking at you know we create a daily mindset practice on gratitudes and visioning and empowering beliefs and empowering questions and making sure that you know by doing this you're reshaping the brain and you're going to be able to work through this and be successful on the other side so it's just every single day you're just recommitting to yourself recommitting to your life recommitting to your vision for your life and uh, and the mindset takes you there so focus on those things and i have no doubt you'll be successful thank you again all right where is the best place for listeners to get more dr evan <laughs> So the best place is on my website, fixyourfatigue.com. But I know that you're going to also drop a link below here and make it easier for folks so they can just click on that. And, you know, we've got education on there. I've got my own podcast. Um, There's lots of different uh, learning opportunities there. And if you find that you're interested in seeing if if we're a good fit to work together, you can jump on a free call with us and uh, see if that's the case. So good. Awesome. All right, listeners, now it's your turn. If there was a question that you wish I would have asked Dr. Evan, you can leave that below the show notes at flipping50.com forward slash fatigue doc. So it'll be right there for you. And we welcome your comments. So if there's a question that comes in, I will absolutely share it with Dr. Evan Hirsch and he will, I'm sure, respond. Yes. You'll also be able to connect with him at his site. The links are in the show note. I've also included his social media links. So he's got some great options for you to follow and stay in tune there. So it's a topic near and dear to many of our hearts. And I know that you'll find this uh, valuable as far as an episode goes. So there you have it, flipping50.com forward slash fatigue doc for your questions and comments. What are you waiting for? Let's start flipping 50 today.